Right, a, a very good morning to you all folks. Um, I hope you are all well. Um, we're off, we're off and off, up and running. It's been a while since I've hosted one of these webinars. So uh, welcome back everybody. Um, Kat has been doing a great job of, of hosting some of the other uh, guests that have been with us and uh, uh, a great recent webinar by, um, by Graham Hendra. We've got tons of new stuff um, coming up for you. And this particular talk by Luke, um, Luke will do a great job of introducing himself, but this particular talk by Luke starts a, a kind of a new phase of what we're doing here. So in September, uh, we are going to be doing webinars around the general topic of kind of health and well-being. Um, and then we're going to have almost like themed months. So to give you an idea, Luke's going to talk about wellness and, and how that affects, uh, sorry, lighting and how that affects uh, health and, and well-being. We've got biophilic design later on in the month. We've got a case study uh, about Putnam High School. Uh, we've got stuff about overheating. So generally around health and well-being. And then as we go through um, the other months, we're going to have other other similar topics. So as I say, today is all about um, Luke Crutcher, and and he's going to better explain it. But it's about an introduction to uh, integrated uh, lighting and, and how that can affect occupants of a building. Um, by way of a bit of admin, uh, you'll be more than used to this. Do keep your mics on mute. Uh, do ask questions in the chat box that we've got up there as normal. We'll, we'll answer them at the end um, to try and tight and keep the content. Uh, flowing uh, and as always we'll record this webinar I'll have this up on YouTube so if you have to drop out or, or uh, you can't for whatever uh, stick the full duration or you want to watch this in the middle of the night you can do so in all its glory. Um, you guys will be well aware of mesh work um, but again for the benefit of people who are watching this as a recording uh, the network is is fast growing we're far towards 600 people uh, and we are you know very much looking to to get towards about the kind of the thousand mark towards christmas and beyond then so the more people that we get together the more great stuff that we'll be putting in front of you guys uh, and we are on the verge as well of starting to launch some courses as well uh, and that is that's something that we'll, we'll announce very very shortly so by way of just a few seconds of introduction to mesh energy if you're new to these webinars we're an independent and energy consultancy practice and cover the UK and done projects in Europe and, and even across the pond in the States. But fundamentally, we're here to work with design teams, try and bring the best people together to make sustainable design as successful as possible. Sustainable design is, is mushrooming into uh, and, and overlapping in so many elements of building design. But we're here to try and share our experience and try and make sure your project, as small or as big as it is now, um, is, is successful and your clients brave about how great you are about sustainable design and uh, bring you the next project and the next project and the next project. So we're here to kind of grease the, reel, the wheels and, uh, uh, and very much kind of maximise the, the benefits that sustainable can provide for you. That's all I'm going to say for the moment. I'm going to uh, stop my screen share and hand over to uh, Luke. Um, so Luke, I mean, Luke and Luke and I have known each other for a good few uh, years and, and, and worked on a number of projects together, uh, but I'll let Luke share his screen and, uh, and, and properly introduce himself and talk to you for the next, what, half an hour, 40 minutes, Luke, you reckon? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll try and rattle through a few slides that, yeah, just try and catch up some time. Um, sure. But yeah, yeah, under 40 minutes, I reckon, easy. Yeah. Over to you. Perfect. So good morning, everyone, eventually. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, as, as Doug's introduced me, I'm Luke from Living Home Tech, one of the three brothers, uh, founders and directors of the company. Been going for 16 years. Um, so we have a lot of experience in, in, in tech, home tech um, and commercial tech as well. So today we're going to be talking about lighting design and also how can it affect the sustainability. Um, this is a course that I co writ with a couple of other members as well of um, CEGA, which is like our governing body for our industry. Um, so I'm one of their presenters. It's REBA certified, et cetera, as well. So it's a little bit about the background of the CPD itself. So the aims of the course are to just dis dis discuss the, the types of lighting that we can use, um, the, the difference between light and design techniques as well. Um, understanding the, the quality of the, the light and the role that it can play in lighting design. Um, design considerations as well, that's a, that's a big factor. 
and then also identify what technology professionals can bring within these projects um, and what uh, a competent technology integrator will be able to deliver for you. So first of all, so why is light important? So light is essential for, for any interior space. You know, we've all seen um, projects that could have been spectacular and it's just lacking something or a bit of design for it hasn't gone into that space. Um, it's a very powerful tool. The feeling of space can be completely transformed um, by alternating the intensity or the placement um, or even the colour of light within these spaces. Um, wherever light, there, there is light, there are shadows. Shadows are free, shadows are great, shadows are our friend, and they can really give you that wow factor as well in these, in these um, designs. So here we, we have um, a short sort of animation, if you like, of a typical open plan space. So here we're gonna show some basic lighting, the standard runway grids that we all see in a, in a lot of um, developments. It's easy to do that. It's, it's not creating any shadows, it's very boring. It's just lit that whole space. Um, there, there's no intensity there, uh, there's no drama. Um, so this is typically what we see in a lot of projects. Um, it's the first thing I look at when I walk into a room. It might be quite sad, but I do look up to the lighting and see the placements. If we look at what we call luxury lighting and what we would do it as a design, we have here where we're using different types of lights, not just lining up a load of down lights in grid and putting them every half a meter. So we're actually using up lighters, bringing texture on the textured featured wall, being able to switch these independently as well. So you can create drama with a control system at the touch of a button, all of a sudden you're transforming the, transforming the mood of that room. You still got your task lighting. So if you're cooking or entertaining in there, you've, You've still got that high intensity light where you need it, but you've also got that nice, relaxing, soothing light with, with the feature lighting, particularly the up lights uh, and over the table. So when you are just trying to wind down for the evening, you, you can switch that room to that, to that feeling. So let's talk about the, the types of lighting. So we're going to be talking about task lighting, ambient lighting, decorative and ascent lighting. So they're the four types. And, and this is when we're typically doing design, this is what we, we're thinking about. Not in every room, but most rooms, um, you know, not every room needs to tick all these boxes. We understand that. So you've got to look at what that person's gonna be using that room for. So when we're laying out a lighting, laying out a lighting plan, these are the different functions that of lighting designs are concerned with. So with task lighting, this refers to increasing Illuminance to better accomplish a specific activity. This is the most important um, of tasks, like it's like an office. So it's in, improving the contrast in that area. General lighting can be can be to, to reduce the the because of task lighting provides focus light where needed. Examples would be a lamp on the desk or under cabinet lighting or a specific furniture um, to illuminate the counters while you're preparing dinner. Dinner. The second type of lighting is ambient. So this is general, general lighting, um, day to day, and there's no specific task, it's just a light um, that allows you to see uh, where we live. Third type would be the, the decorative lighting. So this is how it sounds. This is to, you know, it's, it's meant to draw attention to something, a piece of artwork, some, some kind of collection, you know, there's a piece of furniture that you want to show off. So this, this is that decorative lighting. And the ascent lighting is focused on a particular area object. So this often highlights um, in gardens, for instance, you know, it might be a specific tree or sculpture or something that needs to be lit as well. So the basics, so task lighting is, is doing a job. So that the cooking, working, reading, ambient lighting to allow you to see the room simply, um, general lighting, your day-to-day -day living, decorative, it's a feature in itself, typically. So chandeliers, um, a specific wall light, you know, it, it, it's, it's more about the look of the fitting rather than the light output. And then you've got the ascent lighting, so you're specifically lighting something now.
So la layering is great, and that's how we can create an atmosphere in a room. So it's all about combining different types of light uh, to, to create a sense of depth. Um, and you can transform that room at the touch of a button. There's a control system. And when I say different lights, I don't mean different colors of light. So we don't want to be flooding the room with different Kelvin, which we'll come on to later on. We've got a warm white uh, LED strip, and then your, your down lights are a real high, bright daylight. That's a big no-no. So the types of lighting. So we've got, obviously, down lighting is the most common form of lighting. Uh, it's great for ambient wall washing, tar, so it's really, really good to, to be using in projects. We use it sparingly. You know, we don't need to have a, a downlight every meter within these rooms. Um, it, you know, people may think that if they're using poor quality fittings, but the, the idea is use a better quality fitting, less of them. So get away from that ceiling acne, as, as, I, as we call it. Um, we don't want to see grids and grids of downlights. Um, that, that's not good design. So where possible as well, budget depending is use plaster in and trim the fittings. So it really gives that nice clean feel. Um, and you know, we're not doubling the cost of fitting. So if you're already using a very good fitting from uh, certain manufacturers, you know, to add a, a plaster in bezel, you're not doubling the cost. So where, where it permits and budgets that obviously there is a budget to, to be concerned with, let's get the plaster in fittings. It makes such a difference. It doesn't have to be every room, it could just be key rooms, you know, your open plan spaces, living areas, entertaining rooms, utility rooms and plant rooms and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's just put a basic down light in. There's no need to go to that expense. Um, you can also go a step further with that with down lights now, where we can bespoke them to be a, a specific row colour to match the ceiling finish. Um, it might be to match the, the, the range of the sockets in that room. So you can now really bespoke these to, to blend into the ceilings. We do a lot of that in our cinema rooms where it's typically a dark black ceiling. We're using brow colored um, fittings to match that as well. Then we come on to up lighting. Now up lighting is great. Um, it's, it's generally a form of accent lighting. So it's a great way of adding drama. Just look out the way it just, it just lights this, this um, stone wall. Um, generally use narrow beam as well to just give it that drama uh, and get it as tight to the wall as possible so you don't want to see fittings that are out in the middle of the floor because they're lighting nothing they're just lighting air which is not effective um, so nowadays as well we've gone away from obviously being a heat issue so with leds we're not giving off loads of heat so you can walk on them barefooted kids don't burn themselves etc so that concern's totally gone away as well which is great so you need to ensure the placements of these. You know, you don't want to come to a project and you, you've put these nice fittings along and then the client comes along and puts their big side table over two of them. So you need to careful plan um, as well. So the biggest benefit with LED lighting is obviously energy efficiency. So it's low heat radiation and thousands of hours of use. So, you know, you're not, there's no maintenance with these really. Get the odd failure or driver failure here and there but the maintenance on these is really low compared to the old halogens, et cetera. Uh, so you, you may have some projects which will have independent third-party energy consultants as part of the design team. So there should be consideration for specific requirements for the certification, the assessment of sustainability as well. So you need to be looking at, at these working with the consultants and making sure you're conforming to Partel, et cetera, as well, which we can go into more detail later on. We come into wall washing. So wall washing is great. And it's, it's a great way of lighting the room. Uh, in rooms with lighter colored walls, it would be a great way to add ambient lighting into the room um, and reflecting off of walls rather than just down lighting. Um, so use conventional down lights with a tilt to create the scalloped effect or use specialist wall washers for fixtures to create an even uniform wash to light over a wall. These fittings can particularly be useful for lighting artwork. So there's specific fittings that we use now that give you a nice boxed light beam so you're lighting a piece of artwork on the wall it's got to bear in mind if that artwork moves how flexible is your lighting to, to, to move with that floor washing is great for hallways landing staircases it's a great night light particularly with kids i use them in my house for, so kids can find their way to our bedroom they stay on the whole night they're low energy running um, so we don't mind leaving them on 
Um, it's a great way of, of marking the way as well. In a commercial aspect, it's actually a great way to you know, show people the exits, et cetera, as well. Um, in particularly great in bathrooms. So if you, you walk into your bathroom past 10 o'clock at night, this could bring on your low level floor washers. It's not gonna completely wake you up with your big bright down lights. It might not bring on your fan. So you can go into the bathroom late at night and not wake up the whole household, et cetera. Um, and then they will turn off after you've um, vacated as well. Just got to be careful of placement again, as with the up lighters, you know, you've got to be careful with furniture placement, the age of staircase um, installers, that sort of thing, just to make sure that your fitting is going to fit and they're going to be in the right place and be effective. Um, There's nothing worse than a client turn, client turn around to you and saying, well, that's, that's pointless, I'll, I'll put a plant pot there, you know, that sort of thing. So it's just a bit of careful design and that's the aging of the whole design team making sure ceiling coffers very popular particularly in our cinema rooms and media rooms because it, it gives us an opportunity to drop the ceiling to allow for services and speakers that sort of thing but it gives us another opportunity to actually use it as a a, a lighting feature um, so it's a, it's a great pleasing light and indirect light and it's amazing the amount of light actually you can achieve off the just reflecting off of the white ceiling um, we've actually done rooms where there's no down lights whatsoever. So their main light is the LED profile all around a, a coffer. Um, and the clients are skeptical. You know, you've really got to convince them that there is enough light output here if you use a high powered one. Um, if you've got lamps and things as well to bring into that to, to help when needed, but it is really effective of a way of doing that. Um, so care should obviously be taken with design and the shape of the coffer. Uh, don't overcomplicate it. Your plaster has got to be on form. You know, if it's done poorly, it will show up the poor plaster as well. So that's another thing to be um, mindful of. Um, but obviously with these particular projects, usually the plasters are, are pretty good. Um, you can also get products that are plastered in now. So if you haven't got the space to do an actual coffer, you can do a nice, neat, linear profile with a nice diffuser and light rooms that way as well. So there's, there's other ways of doing it. Lots of, we're spoiled for choice with products, which is great. Uh, track and linear. So track has got more popular in the residential market as well now. A couple of reasons, art, et cetera, is getting more popular. And also they look more attractive. You can get plaster in profiles now. So it's not your, your normal commercial track that you think of. Um, so they're a lot more linear, but it's really flexible. It's great. We love using this because if a client moves a piece of artwork, you can move a fitting with it. If they add another piece of artwork, you can simply click another one in. Um, so it's really flexible. We use a lot of it around our offices as well because we're forever changing and mix and matching and just trying new products. So it's great for that. So yeah, it's just always um, use, you know, good quality track as well. It's worth that extra expense that you can add and adapt to later on. We come on to sort of de decorative lamps. So table lamps are a great way to create layers of light as well. Make sure they're controlled from a wall switch. If they, even if they haven't got a smart lighting control system, still control them from the wall switch because otherwise they just don't get used. You know, they're often in a, you know, the, the, the lamp socket itself will be in a tight corner out of the way because the client wants it out of sight. So they then got to reach around to turn that on, et cetera. And they just end up not being used. So it's really nice to have a scene set if you have got smart lighting control of, of reading or TV watching, wherever it may be. Um, and they can hit that and that actually controls the lamps themselves. It's a great feature. Um, and that's just designed for at that point. Um, so a little side note is some decorative lights can be tricky um, to make dimmable depending on what system you've got uh, running it, if it's standard or a smart lighting, like, you know, Rayco, Lutron, uh, KNX, et cetera. So it's making sure that they are going to be compatible and dim. We, we don't want flickering light, that type of thing. Best way is to, we always test, we always test it. It's better to test it in the office and just leave them running, make sure they are going to smooth dim, not create any flicker, um, because that's really uncomfortable. So, you know, you're trying to create a relaxing wellness place for your clients. If a nice flickering LED in the, in the corner is not going to help in any way. We've got shelving and joinery as well. So really key that you coordinate this with the cabinet makers to make sure that they've left enough voids, et cetera, for your profile to go 
think you don't want to see any of this nice diffused light it's really powerful as well um, so usually the cabinet makers themselves will install a profile for you then your on-site team will, will install the LED strip and connect up and do the final connections it's making sure that design team is all on the same page with this is what's going into here You come into colour change now. That's a real personal kind of view on it. Um, you know, I've seen it done wrong, and we're in projects. Um, but also, you can have some fun with it with fibre optic colour change in cinema rooms, games areas. There's so there is spaces to do it. Um, you know, we have done sensory rooms using colour change, so soothing rooms, so no reds, of course. So nice soothing blues and greens, positive colours. We've actually used that. For, for wellness rooms where it, people just go and sit in a room full of colour. Um, so that really does help with wellness. It really, it's really powerful and we've got great results from that. So then we come on to daylight and shading. So with lighting control, it includes both natural and artificial light. So we've got to control that. While we control the light fixtures in the home, we also must account for the natural light coming into rooms and how it affects our lighting. This can be done by using motorized shades, which can be controlled manually, of course, or through keypads and, and automated as well as part of lighting scenes. So if you've got a good night scene, it might bring on specific lamp lights by your bed, it's gonna close your blinds. Now all of a sudden at the touch of a button, you've now got that chill out, I'm winding down for the evening, that's my space. Um, it's really effective. Um, so shading obviously is, is control of the daylight and glare and overheating as well. You know, we don't want to have a lot of modern projects now have a lot of glazing and you do get solar gain from them so what we don't want is clients to be heating their house up all day while they're at work coming home and having all their aircon working um, for you know four or five hours to try and cool that so let's try and reflect the heat away from the buildings when it's not needed um, and also it will keep the heating in the winter so it's it's, it's making sure that we're using shades and, and um, shear blinds etc to, to its full benefits and having a control system will help that we can automate that so it's easier for the end user they haven't really got to think about it once it's set up correctly things like a daylight sensors um, you know so it's closing blinds automatically for you um, it's a great feature make it makes it more convenient and reliable um, how many times we, we start off the right way go yep yeah, i'm going to close that blind at this time every day and after a week or so that falls away and doesn't happen so you've stopped using it we come on to light quality, um, which is, is key. Uh, so we're going to go into it a bit more detail here. Um, so, so what not only look good, but the quality of the light as well. So brightness. So brightness is, is how is, is luminaire is measured in lumens, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, so it's like a cheap GU10 might be as little as 200, 230 lumens. Um, but with a high quality down light, it could be over a thousand lumens. So the difference is huge. Um, so if they're always dimmable, we always make our lights dimmable as well. You can also, you know, you, you, you can make that intensity less. But it's nice to have that for your task lighting, etc. when you need it. And also there's regulations to adhere to as well within new projects. Um, so as I say, lumens is a measure of luminix flux. It's a total, total amount of light that's emitted. Um, and it's measured from the surface as well, how much light falls onto that surface. So when looking at specifications of a luminaire, pay attention to the lamp initial lumens to the lumen level of the light source and the LED chip. So in commercial, often the lux level criteria is obviously more than residential. Residential is a lot more subjective. Um, so it's about creating that more comfortable and appropriate environment within the residential. When you're specifying light fixtures, obviously you need to consider the part L requirements uh, with a minimum of 75 lamp lumens per circuit. It's, it's amazing, actually, it's less now, but it's amazing when these LEDs first come out and you actually worked it out for yourself that a lot of fittings and lamps fall well short of that part L. Um, so it's making sure that you, you are putting enough requirements and, and looking at that as well. We come on to beam angles. So high quality luminaires will allow you to select different beam angles. Um, so you can have real narrow, um, sort of eight to 15 degree of beam angles. So if that's you want to specifically light 
like an object. Um, it's more of that spot rather than a flood. And you've got wide beams, anything from 27 up to sort of 60. This is typically for your task lighting. You know, you're lighting a space. You just want that quality light and a wider angle. So here as well, it's lighting the, um, the vase on the table. And that's a narrow beam. So we come on to color temperature, which is key. Um, the color temperature should be considered for every room. So you might mix and match. One room might be real daylight, the other might be warm white, but we never mix and match in the same space. That's a big no, no. Um, so you may use warm white, which is 2,700 to 3,000 Kelvin, in your main living spaces, your key task areas, utility rooms. You might opt for a, a, a daylight, as we call it. So 4,000 up, um, that more intense, you know, you just want it. Think dentist, you want that high, bright commercial look in that utility room. Um, I use it in my garage just because I want that bright light. Um, you know, I'm not going in there to chill out, um, et cetera. So it, it's, it's nice to have that intense light. I say, be careful not to mix color temperatures. Um, I see it particularly in commercial all the time because it's easy for someone just to buy a different lamp that they, they found and they plug that lamp in, it's a different color temperature. That's not good for our human eye. You, you can't adjust to that and it confuses your eyes as well, which is then not um, relaxing. Very discomforting. Circading lighting. So we've actually done this for a while now um because it's, it's really important so it's designed to to mimic natural light how the human body is is energized with with cool light in the morning but that relax with warm light in the evening uh it changes obviously throughout the day keep in tune with your circadian rhythm so we've we've done projects in the past with control system it's you know you, you, your client does need to have a, a budget for this it's not cheap um, where in the morning it's that high, bright intensity light in their kitchen. So it's waking the kids up, it's getting everyone ready for their day. And when they come home and they do want to have dinner and start relaxing, then fittings are now going into that warm white pattern and they're going into chill out mode. And that's what we're natural, obviously the, the rhythm of the sunlight, etc. That's how our bodies um, react to light. Um, and the light, lighting control system can mimic that for you within properties now. Um, it's getting more and more popular, so I should imagine cost of fittings and control systems will get more competitive. Um, but we probably we did it about five years ago, but it's now coming more and more frequent and, and used as well. Different. Uh, a little side note for that is it's different cabling as well. So it's not really a retrofit option at the minute. I'm sure products will come out. Um, but for a reliable control system at the minute, you are using different control protocols, which require different cabling as well. We come on to color rendering, CRI. Um, this gives you values, um, how each color is measured and it's the quality of the light source. Um, I won't go too far into this, but you should be looking, um, you know, cheap lamps will give you an overall R9 rating of around 80. Um, so if you do want to have a high quality light output within your projects, we are now achieving that around CRI of 98 in that's pretty standard for good quality LED. If they're not achieving that, then it's not up for that quality. That's the way you look at it. Um, so this is how it's measured in the reds. Um, so sunlight is 100. So that we're trying to get as close to that as possible. And we'll come on to um, how that can affect the way we see things, objects and things, how that reflects the light. It's a poor light against a, a good luxury LED fitting. Um, it does make a huge difference. It's not really a standard for that in dwellings, um, but us as designers are just trying to get the best light for our, our, our projects and our clients. Really helps with the wellness. So here is a quick animation. So the vase on the left is a real low CRI, just a cheap GU10 lamp. And then the vase on the right is using a 
high quality, low, low angle beam, uh, luxury LED fitting from different manufacturers, but that CRI is 98. It's huge difference. And, and I, I recommend you guys, if, if you, we have a little test in our office and we just put them side by side, um, you know, it's not a gimmick, it's, it's facts. And it, it really, when you sit side by side, it's, it's really surprising as well. So if you're lighting pieces of artwork, et cetera, with a poor LED, you're not actually going to see that in a true reflection. So how to plan for integrated lighting. So every house has a unique set of requirements. Every house is different. Um, so we're here as specialists to design systems that meet the specific needs of each design. Um, and when you should start talking to a technology integrator uh, that can deliver this is, is around sort of reaper stage two. It's never too soon to discuss it, um, especially if you are planning coffer lighting, spe specific areas that need lighting. You know, there might be something at construction stage that needs to happen um, to allow that, you know, whether it's a type of cabling or the contract that needs to allow uh, a specific void or there's not enough void, so you then got to pay attention to these areas. So it's, it's a consideration for it all. Um, so we obviously consider for disability users, positions and heights of control switches, will there be handheld devices to aid disability clients as well? Uh, the lead design should reference part M access to use of buildings volumes one and two documents as well. Um, so this obviously references that and we've done projects where we've held, helped disability clients um, be able to operate their homes sufficiently. So the type of design documentation um, that you should be getting from your integrator or lighting designer, um, they'll be able to produce full scale, whether it's AutoCAD or other projects, they, uh, products they're going to use. There's a full lighting design and key of what fittings going where, if you're an electrician to follow, so clearly labeled circuits, panel drawings, so that all the plant rooms can be um, finalized and planned as well. It's really key. That, that happens there's a clear plan there that everyone signs off on on the design team i say planning starts early um there's no such thing as talking to designers too early as we all know the sooner the better um once planning is approved really you can start loosely discussing things um but certainly sort of reach stage two really is, is the latest um once a concept understood the technical design um but we're, we'll be right the way through the process right the way through to aftercare so your designer should be there to, to make sure that their design is implemented. Uh, I rack through it quite quickly. So yeah, that um, brings us to the end. So thank you, we got there in the end. Uh, yeah, thanks Luke. No um, problem. I learned a lot. Um, you've even answered some of my questions that I asked right at the start. Uh, so a reminder guys, if you've got questions um, for Luke, do, do uh, put them in the, in the chat box there. We've got a few. Um, which we'll we'll run through, and then hopefully that gives you guys a bit of time to uh, to ask some. Um, Richard has asked about the the tada aspirations that you put up at the uh, uh, at the front there, um, Luke. Um, how are they, or how should they be reconciled with the design standards required by Briam? Um, if that makes sense to you, then then so be it. Otherwise, Richard might be able to unmute himself and describe a bit more about what he means there. Obviously, the Briam requirements, depending on which level you go to, become increasingly more uh, challenging, should we say, particularly on outstanding projects where the, you know you've really got to go to the nth degree to make sure that you're meeting that that kind of criteria. Um, but d d are you able to are you able to to kind of answer that question, or do, do you need more info to answer that, um, Luke? Yeah, more info if we can on that. Okay, one. Rich, yeah. do you want to um, do you want to just unmute yourself and just just describe what you mean by that? Yeah, I mean what it is under Brian. There's lots of SS SLL lighting guides that are referred to um, that seem to be very um, they're very prescriptive and um, and detailed on what the requirements are for a given type of use of space. But one of the challenges is that if you, if the use of that space doesn't quite fit those standard requirements that are expected of Bria, so maybe it's not, it's a space that 
might be, say, a counselling space, for example, um, which ordinarily might have be very um, hospital-like, dare I say it, um, whereas the client aspirations might be something more along the line of wanting that to be a relaxing, more ambient environment. And it's just trying to match up or reconcile those, those justifications with really. um, Because then if, if a lot of your spaces don't really conform to the BREAM requirements, then you're at risk of not receiving those credits for that particular lighting design. Yeah. I mean, do you design for both? Or Yeah, you, you try to without being silly with it. You know, you end up with doubling up and things. I've seen that happen just to tick a box and then it's, you know, designs not really what you were looking for so so in that aspect if they want that real has to tick a box with high intensity light is the light fittings we've used before in a commercial aspect to tick that box but you can also swap that over to that warm relaxing light when you want it to so it's just knowing what boxes are needed to be ticked and and then we're lucky with with obviously the the products we've got now yes they can be expensive but we're able to the dual purpose fittings then, you know, they will be, they will be able to dim down at a warm white level. So you're nice, relaxing ambient lighting and it can be a relaxing space, but it's also can be ramped up to a high intensity daylight. So that needs to be used from a com commercial aspect. Um, it's really popular in kitchens, that type of thing, because they want that high intensity light, but then they want to have it, in, in chill out mode, if you like, when in the evenings and things and have it back to the home. So there, there is products that you can do it with. It's just whether there's the budget there as well, because it's quite expensive. Um, they're not, they're not cheap. Thank you. Any more questions? Sorry, I'm muted. There you go. It happens every single time. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Luke. Um, the, the next couple of questions I asked were you answered one of them, which was about, you know, increasingly we get asked, you know, we, we kind of we, we get the idea that bringing you guys in earlier would make sense. Uh, we don't want to spend a ton of money doing it. When is the kind of when is the sensible kind of light touch moment? And you touched on that, Luke, you know, particularly if there are special um you know, special requirements for that project where it, it's it, it's either um, an awkward structure or it's, got, or it's got specialist spaces or the needs of the occupants are such that, you know, lighting is is, is higher in, in the priority to make sure that it doesn't um, fall yeah. wayside and you don't have to undo the good work that you've done as you move through the REBA stages. Um, yeah. so, and you said kind of REBA stage two there for kind of initial input. Yeah, like I said, I always tell clients it's never too early. You know, I'd rather we were loosely yeah. discussing things. Once they got planning approved, um, there's a project that we're doing at the minute and obviously we've done all the design and it's a concrete pour. So we've had to get the contractor to shut a certain areas where downlights are going because the, the voice yeah. is big enough. Um, so, and they've been able to do that because they're discussing it with us early. So yeah. you can imagine if they just carried on, oh, we've done our concrete pour. What, what can you do? We're then, we're then limited with what products we can use and what type of light or, and speakers and things as well. So there's lots of things to consider. Yeah, particularly, the, you know, you're, you're right there, the construction methodology as well. I mean, we've done a big project, um, Richard and I uh, and, and, and some of the other team members are working on a, on a considerable CLT project. And, and really, we've had to gone, we've had to have far, far earlier got into detailed design and understood yeah. where everything's running, all the service voids, because there's because there's a lot of exposed CLT in the structure. Yeah. And, you know, the, these walls are kind of, you know, like 300 millimetres thick. So everything's got to be planned. And so everything gets pushed to those earlier stages because they're trying to push the button on getting the CLT manufactured and then there's a lead yeah. time. And then in order to hop, not hold the rest of the project up. Yeah, it's like you say, it had to have been had earlier and earlier and earlier. It's tricky because as a design team, you know, you're asking questions things like, where's your bed going? And the client's like, why do you need to yeah. know that now? You know, we're not even out the ground. It's like, well, once this concrete's mm. poured, we can't then get cables to that position. Yeah. So it's just like you say, all your service boards with MPHR, air conic, et cetera. It's got to be considered and you know we don't want boxing later on do we and no and, and nobody wants to yeah exactly be there with a router you know and, and yeah or buggers trying to you know 
yeah, yeah for weeks time and channel and i yeah. say you know, particularly if you've got exposed finishes and stuff yeah. it just is it becomes a nightmare and then yeah. it's rockets and, you know, was, the other done question correctly. sorry Luke? if the design's done correctly as well it just yeah. goes in you know that's that's the beauty of it so so yeah. my, my other question started out um again kind of quite primitive really and, and i was kind of more house-based but i think the more i think about it and this comes back to early design um you know, I asked about PIR lighting. So we've all been in buildings or particularly office spaces where you've got PIR lighting on and you're the last person in the office and you're, you're not doing a lot other than beavering away on the computer and the lights go out and you're there waving your, you know, yeah. you're your hands about. And I've been in some, you know, so we've seen that kind of commercially, but, you know, I've seen some uh, amazing private homes done where you've got PIR lighting that kind of follows you around as you kind of walk around the house. Yeah. And I guess you know I, I i i'm kind of assuming that pir lighting is quite well evolved now so you know if you were to have that in whatever situation it's very 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 sensitive now to movement if the placement of the pir sensors and stuff are are correctly, correctly done yeah not not only that but with if it's you know if it's connected to a smart control system as well most mm. of now what we can set up is that we can override the pir so disable it almost Okay. So, you, you know, you, like you say there, you're in your study and you, you're not particularly moving a lot. You're just sat at a desk. You can mm -hmm. just disable it quickly at your, it, it is light switch, disable the PIR. And now I'm just going to put the down lights on and that's it. Until, until mm -hmm. I turn that back on, it's not going to do anything. Obviously with standard PIRs, you can't do that. So it's making sure the placement's correct as best yeah. you can. You know, if you've got a hallway running outside of a, a bathroom or something, you don't want it. To, to be able to catch you walking past so every time you walk past we've all been there haven't we in the hotel or something that lights come on in the room for no per no no reason mm. so it's using unnecessary power yeah um, so yeah that pirs are great if they're in the right place and you can pr program mm. them as well because mm. sometimes they can actually be a nuisance and mm. clients can sometimes so oh, actually i just disable them because it catches me there yeah. you know and didn't want it to come on so yeah and, and the other the other the other question i had um and there's a there's a, uh, a couple of others coming in the other question i had was about you know we it's always tempting as you mentioned led lighting and and the energy usage from lighting is getting lower and lower and lower but we 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 kind of fall into this trap where stuff gets more efficient and we just put more stuff in um but, yeah because we you know but, because, you know, because it's more convenient and 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 I, and I would hope that the reason that most people are on this call other than to learn about lighting and, and things like that can can understand when you know the subtleties of some of those fixtures rather than having one pendant in your living room you know it's nice to have a bit of up lighting a bit of down lighting you know if you've got the money in the space and, and the inclination um, and that means a few fittings they may only be a fraction of the the output of a 60 watt good old-fashioned 60 watt incandescent light bulb yeah you know you've got other other stuff going on there and and increasingly as we work towards getting a better understanding of the energy usage of buildings at an early stage again having getting that blend right between design energy usage and being able to map out how much of a deal or a contribution is lighting going to be on these projects in in my mind you know we, we see it you know it has to form part of the equation particularly in schemes where lighting is really important you know yeah how much energy you're going to be using and balancing out the, the 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 right rooms and the right lighting for it versus just getting silly with the amount of stuff that you're putting in there and the energy usage just going through the roof yeah exactly it's been sent this is a sensible stick at it and and making sure that you're using the correct fittings as well and less of them i i do feel in a lot mm. of projects people are scared to use less down lights for instance and they, they, they're obsessed with that. Oh, I must have a down light every meter. Mm -hmm. We don't need it. You, you know, most of the time you're lighting nothing. You know, there's no consideration of actually how that client's going to use the room. In their, their yeah, and, and, and like all these things, the, the, the elegance of design is, is actually, you know, using less to do a heck of a lot more rather than just yeah. being lazy and, and throwing yeah. fittings and, and, and kit at the problem. Yeah. Um, one last question that's come in. Uh, Richard Manson said, yeah, he's done CLT stuff and completely gets the early stage design and, and yeah. deep design is... It'd be a nightmare quickly. <laughs> but he's also asked a, a bit of a techie question here. Is there any advice on possible harmonic distortion or power quality issues that may be caused 
and any advice on this as to how it might be overcome if that's the case. So do you, are there any kind of harmonic distortion or, or power quality issues with? It, it, it depends on the, on the product you're going to use as well. You know, you can get distortion on products and we've seen it before where you can get different batch issues from products. So the quality of, of the batches aren't up to standards as well. You know, you might order it one week, it's great. The next week it's not. It's the same product, you know, same box, and you look at the batch numbers, and I go, yeah, yeah, we've had a bit of a batch issue there. I'm like, okay, how can that happen? So, yeah, there, it's like anything. If you if you're using quality manufacturers, and you do your research mm. on that. You know, mm. Doug knows us quite well. We will always use quality manufacturers that can prove it, and yeah, we ask them questions of how is this produced, etc. And rather than just going for the cheapest that we can find. Um, they're often the ways, unfortunately, they're the ones that will give you the issues in you know, mm. that cheaper product, unfortunately. So mm. it's just doing your homework on that and making sure you're not going to end up, um, you know, with, with lots of issues at the end of the project. There's nothing worse. Um, it's, yeah, just doing your homework on it, really. Yeah. We're, we're sure. testing fittings all the time, you know, just leaving them running for, for a couple of days at the office, just seeing if anything distorts any time dimming right down to like two percent you know really stress testing it and making sure it's gonna gonna perform yeah. for us so and and you guys um i don't think we've got any other questions but that's a good thing you mentioned that i mean you guys have got a you guys have got a showroom haven't you down in um down in pool if I'm, yeah i'm right in thinking yeah and so if anybody's got any any questions obviously we'll, we'll happily share um luke's contact details but if you guys want to kind of take it a step further um you know yeah, it's always nice to it's a fun showroom you know we've got two cinema setups we've got lighting control in here and things so it's quite a fun demo to come and do um we've actually got an event at the end of the month as well if anyone wants to come along they can architects designers etc coming along um have a few drinks and just a catch up really in the industry and see what's new right. it's always changing good stuff good stuff uh, there was one last message oh i think that was from richard again saying um this can be a hard discussion with the client as to why some products are more expensive expensive albeit better quality i know it's difficult and we always try to say yeah. to them you know do you want to be spending 10 pound on a downlight or would mm -hmm. you like to spend 100 pound a downlight and they're always a lost difference and then we always show yeah. them yeah that's that's it we show them and then they get it and not, I'd say ninety percent of them go. We're going for the more expensive one. I get it. I get why we're using it, but we'll put the ten pound ones in the utility room that we don't hardly use. We get that. There's a you got to be sensible with it. Yeah. Um, but lighting is such a key area. It really is. It, it can't be ignored on these projects. Um, you know, I actually say to people, look, let's remove the audio system rather than let's start impacting your lighting by using a cheaper fitting that you're going to get from screw fix or somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not, it's not going to lend itself to that particular project. So but that that's um, yeah, that will continue to be an issue as we all know <laughs> for years to come. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, I appreciate that Luke. Um, Thank, you. Thank you all. As, as normal, we'll, we'll share the presentation after Luke's on Meshwork. So feel free to reach out, ask any questions. Uh, and, and have a discussion offline. Um, just by way of kind of wrapping up, um, next week's webinar, this is, um, we've got an interesting kind of couple of weeks on biophilic design actually, and the, and the next webinar up, for all of you that are, are knocking, you know, tearing your hair out with fire regs, particularly if you're architects and other designers who've come up against, uh, you know, very, very arduous fire regulations and insurance and stuff around that. We have found um, an incredible, um, company called ANS who are talking about how to design living walls. We've all, all seen living walls, pictures on LinkedIn and various things, amazing kind of living walls. But few of us think about the fire safety issues around, uh, you know, material which essentially could be, could be combustible um, at, at some point. So ANS are going to be talking to us about how to properly design green, green walls, talking about the, the regs around it. Um, quite a niche thing, but actually, um, probably as we as we do more with biophilic design and, and green walls, something that we'll be coming against uh, up against more and more and more. So do sign up for that one uh, for for next week. And as I say, the rest of the month we've got a series of topics about health and well-being, covering thermal comfort, biophilic designs, case studies, 
Uh, so do sign up to those ones and we'll keep uh, smashing out the quality webinars for you. Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. Um, join us next week. Take care. Bye-bye.